let me say, uh, first of all, hotep. And hotep simply means peace. It's an ancient word, an ancient greeting. So when I say hotep, it simply means come in peace. So when I say hotep, you say hotep. <laughs> well, good to see you all this afternoon. Thanks for coming out to really hear about uh, our Save Nubia project, and more specifically today, about the classical African civilization of Kush. Uh, there's a, uh, an emerging field that I call Kushology. It's the study of ancient Kush. And this is brand new. I mean, most of us have heard about Egyptologists who study ancient Egypt, but very few people have, have heard about Nubiologists, the study of ancient Nubia. But rarely have we, ha have we heard about Kushology because it's an emerging field and very little work and research has been done. So my field work over the uh, past couple of decades has been in the Nile Valley in Northeast Africa. And I wanna share with you just a little bit of this work, particularly dealing with ancient Kush. Now it's interesting because when many people think about Kush, if they're young, they think about smoking uh, dope. This is pretty much what they think about, a Hindu Kush or something like that. Others have never heard the term at all, but to link Kush to an African civilization is quite rare. So my task is really to share with you the significance of Kush. So that's the oldest of the classical African civilizations. So I want to share with you some of my field work, not only the past couple of decades, but actually in December and this past January. So as um, uh, was mentioned, we're looking to build a team of people to do research to know more about Kush because basically little is known. There's very little known, and, and people mix up Kush in Nubia because the work hasn't been done. So I'm gonna share that with you. And as um, uh, was mentioned, the same Nubia project, we mentioned Nubia because that term is more popular. If we say Kush, people need more explanation. So it's really focused on saving ancient Kush and Nubia from the floodwaters. And some of you are familiar with it. If you're not, no problem. But we wanna focus on Kush today and in the fall on ancient Nubia, and then later on Kemet. So that's really what we focused on today. So this is the area that I'm going to focus on in the few minutes I have, and it's the area that we now call Sudan. And Sudan, as you know, about two years ago was split up. So South Sudan is the newest country in the world. There was a referendum, a vote. So the Southerners decided to break away from the uh, formal government of Sudan that wanted to impose Sharia or Islamic law. The Southerners said, no, we don't want that. They maintained their own tradition, their own culture, their own language, and they didn't want to uh, have to abide by Islamic law, so they broke away. So most of the work that I've done, in fact, all the work in Sudan, that is, has been in uh, the northern part here. You may not can see this too well, but Khartoum is the capital. So as you look at this area, as you go north, it's actually down north, because all the mountains are in the south. So the Nile River runs downhill like all water. So, so most of my work has been in the, in the area north of Khartoum, down north. And I was there in December and, and also in January. I think it might be a little light in here, but my colleague Sorwat, he's a, he's a critical colleague. Wherever I go, he is an assistant. He knows the culture very well, he knows the language. And it's one of the things that's interesting about the Sudanese is that they will literally break away from whatever they're doing and not just spend a couple of hours, but literally days to assist without pay. Their pay is the fact that we're looking to research and recover and uncover classical African civilization in, the region, in, in that region. And the pride is absolutely amazing. We meet strangers along the way and they literally take out days from their time without pay. You can't even give them money because it's disrespectful, because this is something that they do out of their, their, uh, their being. So, you, so it's disrespectful to even offer money. They don't do that. And so anyway, my colleague Sorwad is always helpful along the way. So the uh, three classical African civilizations, we'll start with the first one is Kush. And it's spelled K-U-S-H, sometimes C-U-S-H, and then Nubia, and then, uh, and then Kemet. And we could call these ancient African civilizations but it's better and more appropriate to call them classical because of what classical means. We hear about classical music, classical, what else? Art, classical theater, classical dance, classical music. So what does classical mean? 
Premiere, that's pretty good. Uh, original is close. It means, yes, the best, the prototype, the example, the model, the guide by which everything else is judged. So that's why it's better to say classical African civilizations because from these civilizations, other cultures have benefited. And you'd be very surprised, some of us, that is, at the contributions from classical Africa that we still benefit from today. And people are not even aware of the art and science that has been given to the world. So anyway, uh, there's not a lot known about Kush because the field research hasn't been done. It really hasn't. And it's amazing how the so-called experts are totally confused. And I'll show you a couple of examples. But we don't know when the civilization of Kush began. The further we go back, it seems like the culture is ready-made. When we go back, when I say to the Stone Age, it doesn't mean some age where people were, were underdeveloped um, and didn't know anything. So one brother, I remember a presentation I was doing, he said, you know what, Professor, you should really stop using the term Stone Age. So he's going to give me advice on what term <laughs> I should use. And I said, come again. He said, you should really stop using the term Stone Age. I said, no, you need to change your understanding of what's meant by Stone Age. Because the further we go back before the age of metals, they were building in stone. I asked him, I said, this civilization complex is in the midst of what desert? He said, the Sahara. I said, exactly. I said, what's the most enduring monument in the region that survives time in the desert, that's naturally produced? Pyramids. It's the most permanent shape that survives time in the desert. And they built pyramids, temples, tombs, with any kind of stone that you can mention. Gray whack, limestone, what else? Sandstone. Sandstone. You said Flintstone. 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 <laughs> 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 Many different types of stones, alabaster, you name it. And these are the most enduring monuments. So I said, you need to change your understanding by what we call the Stone Age. But nevertheless, it goes back to that period when we find them mainly building in stone. The area, I'll show you a map, is Northeast Africa, the Horn of Africa, and across the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And there's important centers, which I'll show you, but it's the first organized state that we know of on record. The first organized government goes back to Kush. So it's an important uh, civilization, to say the least. And some of the sources of information is the biblical record. And so in chapter 10, it discusses the table of nations, how different nations emerge. And it's amazing how people could know about this and not connect the dots. Because uh, we know that Noah, according to the biblical text, had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And Ham had four sons. But if we look at the order in which, according to the biblical text, chapter 10, that the sons of Ham emerge, Cush is first. Sometimes it's spelled with a C or sometimes with a K. And this order is not by accident, by the way. It's Cush and then so-called Egypt, Punt, and Canaan. And by the way, according to the biblical uh, theologians, it might sound strange, but according to the, uh, the uh, scholars who look at the Bible, and that is uh, the three sons of Ham represent the three major racial groups. That's strange, I know, but, but uh, if people are going to tell the history of the world from the biblical source, then it makes sense to show that all major racial groups came from one progenitor. So anyway, Ham is supposed to be the progenitor of all people of African descent. And Shem is representing mixed groups, Arab and so forth, mixed groups. And then Japhet, supposedly those that came from Europe. So it is pretty much agreed that the sons of Ham are, represent African or black nations. Anyway, there's records from Egypt, archeological records, which I'll show you and uh, Greek and Roman records. And um, it's pretty difficult to know the details of Kush, but what we can say, if we look at the artifacts, if we look at the stone tools that were used, we know they go back at least 70,000 years in the area of Sudan, if not 80,000 or, or, or older than that. So during this period of 70,000 years or, or so, this is uh, really the Stone Age. And then there is evidence of early kingships and settlements. And when you have settlements, you have farming. Farming is one of the most important inventions because with the introduction of farming, that's what allows for settled communities. It's important. 
So if people don't have agriculture or farming, then they can't settle. There uh, they would be hunters and gatherers, semi-nomadic looking for food. So farming was very important in this period, but these are just broad dates. And then there's an early dynastic period, but what most people are aware of in terms of Kush is the 25th and 26th dynasty, so-called black pharaohs. We, we have to discuss that. Then there's the Meroitic period. We have a long line of very powerful rulers a couple thousand years ago, mainly women ruling during this period. So these are only broad outlines. And as we do more field work, we'll be able to, to uh, plug in the details about the history of, uh, of Kush. Let me show you that what I'm doing is pioneering work. Yes, it is, but it's not entirely new. There are African-American authors and historians that have written about Kush decades ago. These are some of their works, such as The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, published by Drusilla Dunja Houston in 1926. It's almost a century ago. And notice that, and we'll explain the term Ethiopia, John Jackson's book, Ethiopia and the Origin of Civilization, 1939, and then the great William Leo Hansberry, one of the great first-hand researchers who did field work. He never published, so his student, Joseph Harris, published the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook. And Hansberry, able to read Greek and Latin, read the original text, where the Greeks talked about the high status of the people that or were from Cush, and the Greeks, from, for some reason, the Greeks changed Cush to Ethiopia. So Ethiopia is a Greek word, it means burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. So the Greeks were struck by their color. So they changed it from Cush to Ethiopia. So when you see the term Ethiopia in antiquity, in, uh, uh, in ancient times, people really mean Cush, the vast Cushite empire. Here's Drusilla Dunja Houston, one of the great writers from Oklahoma, who in the first part of the 20th century wrote about the wonderful Ethiopians. He made a, a valuable contribution. Many people don't know that much about the great Drusilla Dunja Houston simply because she wasn't cited or quoted by historians such as Carter G. Woodson, who founded African Heritage Month, or W.E.B. Du Bois. They never really gave credit to Drusilla Dunja Houston because she was self-taught. And here's what she said. This is truly pioneering work. And Drusilla Houston argued that the kingdom of Kush extended as far east as India. That's her argument. And here's, so now this is book one, Nations of the Kushite Empire, Marvelous Facts from Authentic Records. So according to uh, the records, Drusilla Houston published six volumes. This is the first one, and now a second volume has been found. Many people have the first volume, but the second one also uh, has now been found by one of the professors, and this is book two. And book two is Origin of Civilization from the Kushites. And here's part of what she said. There seems to be a worldwide conspiracy in literature to conceal the facts that this book unfolds. Because of this suppression of truth, world crimes have been easily made possible against the Ethiopians. When she says Ethiopians, she means black people in general. Because it was a, uh, a, a, a universal term used for black people. And this is in volume book one. That she, she also says this, the chapters of this book prove the Kushite race, notice she's talking about people of African descent, to have been the fountainhead of civilization. If you desire truth, if you desire to be fair-minded, to be educated in vital knowledge not possessed by the average college student, if you desire to be an authority upon the life of the ancients, go down with me as archaeology, ethnology, geology, and philology disclose. She then goes on to say, I have dug up an irrefutable arsenal of facts that Harvard or Yale or cowardly scholarship in our race dare not refute. How can a leadership point uh, the